Let's get started. Ah, actually, really quickly, so this is more of a meta talk. So there's not going to be any kind of coding or anything like that. It's just going to be an overarching talk about basically what happened. So let's start. So this is really quick agenda. First, we're going to be talking about what is Aka Peko. Um, quick show of hands, who knows what it is and not just used it? Okay, cool. <laughs> if you don't know what it is, you can ask me later. Um, the second one, we're going to talk about community governance. So that's basically how are open source projects maintained and governed. And we'll go into like the differences from the transition. Then we're going to talk about the incubation. So this is the Apache process where a new project wants to get into Apache. And then we'll have, you know, the standard conclusion. Cool. So first, let's go through some metrics. Um, ACA is around 15 years old. It's probably not controversial to say it's probably the oldest and one of the most mature Scala projects. Um, I mean, given that Scala is maybe 23 or 24 years old, I can't precisely remember. But yeah, um, ACA was one of the few ones. And as probably everyone right knows here, the core is written mostly in Scala. But historically, and this is also something that we found out when we went through the whole forking process, a lot of people that use ACA and PECO are Java. Um, there's almost two million lines of code. It's pretty big. I'm not going to go out there and say it's one of the, or the biggest style of code base from the open source code bases, maybe, um, but it is one of the largest ones. And yeah, deploys range from everything. Um, there are actual payment systems in banks, you know, massive supply chains and supermarkets that use Akka and now also Peko, and of course you, it's got an whole own ecosystem, so everything from web servers and everything in between. And there's approximately 20 PPMC members, so Peko PMC, PMC is a project management committee. So that basically is like the board of the Peko project. And the initial one is basically when the fork happened. So these are the people that will, you know, um, maintain and do the governance of the project. So yeah, this is the day of judgment, September 7, 2022. It was a fun day. <laughs> um, so yeah, there was this blog released. Um, probably most of us have read it or have heard about it. But yeah, this is when Mike Ben decided to change the license from uh, Apache 2 to BSL. So. One interesting thing with BSL, which by the way stands for Business Source License, so I'm not going to, um, you know, uh, explain how licenses work, I'd be here all day. But one of the major things is it's basically a way to allow uh, companies to, you know, charge for the product. And one of the, I guess, critical important things is most BSL licenses, almost uh, code that uses BSL, has a thing where after a set amount of years it will revert back to Apache. And this will uh, play in a little bit later. One of the fun things is, I think this is the first time in history that a library has went to BSL. Not an application, so you know you can have Elastic or other things. And the interesting thing here is there's an ex exclusion for play in the license itself. And it gets really weird because basically they're telling you that if you happen to use play and you have the Akka BSL, not the Apache version, as a dependency, as an engineer, in your code, you're not allowed to expose, let's say, an ACA stream. So suddenly we're now asking engineers to be lawyers, which um, is a lot of fun. I'm sure that's what everyone dreamt with when they wanted to do coding. <laughs> um, yeah, and so actually, ever since then, Play has actually decided to move to Paco, so don't worry, you don't have to worry about being a lawyer, it's all good. Um, but yeah, that's an interesting tidbit that happened from this. So for people that don't understand why this is there, because if this clause wasn't there, you could just add play to your dependency, and then you could use ACA for free. <laughs> so they had to add this in. So let's keep on going. So one interesting thing here that always comes up in open uh, source, so by the way, I'm an open source guy, that's kind of my day job right now, is the whole bait and switch thing. Which is the argument, you know, someone releases something that's open source, they just did it for branding, for marketing, blah, blah, blah. But that wasn't their true intent, and then they tried to change it. So this is a statement from the CEO of Lightbed. So one of the interesting things here is, is it was open source for a significant amount of time. So I don't think it's very fair to say that it's based and switch. But the reasoning is quite important. I'm not going to read the whole quote, but long story short, apparently ACA was too good 
Um, companies were using it in stable production for many years and it just worked without needing any changes so they didn't get enough enterprise licenses so yeah I guess it was too good to be true um, so the BDFL and the bazaar so those who don't know what BDFL that's benevolent dictator for life um, this is like a term that is used for software projects that are even governed by a single person and I'm going to extend that definition a bit for this talk to a single company, in this case, Lightbed. And the bazaar is from a, kind of a famous book about the cathedral and the bazaar, where you have a more decentralized uh, form of governance. And this is basically where Peko is moving to. So, um, you know, before with ACA, anyone could contribute to ACA. It was still an open source project. But at the end of the day, all of the governance, all of the decisions, everything was done by Lightbed. And this is going to be significantly different. Um, for Pico. So firstly, time is of the essence. So I don't think I need to talk too much about this, but I'm guessing for the people that were hit by this, um, they were pretty stressed and they probably got something like, you have one year to make a decision from your manager, or something along those lines. So this understandably created a bit of stress for people like myself, but also others working on Pico, to like make a release out there. Um, this is quite problematic um, because from the Apache side of things, there's a lot of bookkeeping and process. We basically had to go through the entire code base and figure out all the references, all of the inclusions of jars, all of the licensing, everything like that, because we have to annotate everything. This is the bookkeeping that needed to be done because Apache actually has insurance for users when you make a release. So this is also a protection mechanism. The problem is, is that it takes a bloody long amount of time. Um, there are some differences as well. So Apache really loves mailing lists. I'm pretty sure if I asked the audience who loves mailing lists, I'd be surprised if I got more than a couple of hands. So this is like an, uh, an example of how disparate the different communities are. Most Scala projects that are open source are just on GitHub. You know, we use issues, we use discussions. Um, that's how most of the management is done. We can do that with Peko, in fact we do, but there are certain things that we have to do on the mailing list. Releases are also kind of more manual. Um, normally most people use something like SBTCI release, where you know you push a tag and make a release. Lightspan had a bit more of a manual process, but with Apache, you have formal voting for people in the PMC. So this is like, um, you have to have minimum three lazy votes to make a release, and also if there's big decisions to be made. Um, I'm going to give a big thanks to Apache Infra, because normally if you need infra support, you have a company, there's no company here, or well, the company is kind of Apache, and they helped out a lot, like um, doing support for what they would find really weird things, like adding Scala Steward as a bot and all of those things, they were very lovely to help out in that. Um, another interesting tidbit, so SPT is like a tool that I have a love-hate relationship with. Um, so one thing that we kind of noticed when we did a fork, so in my opinion, SPT is extremely principled, and it's designed in a very good way, but it also is, um, because it basically created its own dialect in Scala, um, it makes it quite unapproachable. Um, for people that want to help out in the build, which by the way was the majority of the work that we had to do in like the first eight or ten months. It was modifying the build in lots of different ways for like checking for headers and or trying to automate as much as possible when we had to do the Apache release process. And you know, when it was under Lightband, Lightband was also um, working on SPT. I think this is no longer the case. They've moved to Scala Center, maybe? Yeah. Um, but the point is, is if they had a big SPT problem, they could just, you know, ask one of the people to figure it out. Um, in that case, that person is me, and maybe one other person. Um, I'm one of these crazy people that's been using SPT for a while, and I'm no way, no near as much as someone like Eugene, who's been working on it. <laughs> There's no one. Yeah. But this is actually kind of an issue, because build tools is exposed to everyone, right? Almost every single person who writes a project uses a build tool and the minute you have to do something more complicated, it's kind of created a bit of a barrier of entry. Um, but yeah, on the plus side, because we're basically hard forking a project, we manage to do things like you wouldn't normally be able to do. So we are trying, I'm trying to, for example, enable the inliner, which will help hopefully a fair bit on Scala 2. 
that required binary breaking changes, which you normally wouldn't be able to do in the middle of a project, but because you hard forked it, as long as it's source compatible, well, actually not really, we had to rename the packages, but um, the structure, at least, of the code is source compatible, you can do these kind of changes. So, yeah, who are we answering now to? So before we answered to Lightband, um, that's kind of no longer the case. So since Pekka got opened up, we can actually kind of do things that may have not been that tenable before. So by some crazy ideas, well, it's actually not that crazy because uh, well, like a lot of the rest of the Scala ecosystem is already doing it, but Pekka.js, Pekka native. Um, one of the kind of problems you could say that when it was centered under Lightband is that even though it was open source, they're probably more beholden to their clients, whoever they were. So it was a very JVM centric um, product, basically. Um, there's some weird stuff out there. So for example, they had, there's an exclusion in the Peco build for JDK 9 because JDK 9 did something interesting with modules. And this is only there because some client happened to use JDK 9. Um, there's other cases of that, like this OSGI. Um, so interestingly, I'm trying to still uh, maintain OSGI in Peco because we're following Semver, so we can't just drop it at the whim. That is a bit controversial within Peco, but the point is, is that OSGI was again another client of Lightbands, I believe, that was running uh, ACA on cache terminals and it was using OSGI to hot load ACA or something crazy like that. <laughs> Um, but there's other things as well. So you, if anyone has used Akka HTTP, they may know this library. It was called Akka HTTP so, uh, CRS, which is cross-origin resource sharing. Um, because the original uh, Akka HTTP didn't have this in there, even though for the vast majority of web servers, you probably want that. So for when the fork of, uh, fork of Pekka happened, this actually created a diamond dependency, and we just included it in Pekka. Um, so we're able to solve these kinds of things, which is, you know, happen because we're, we decide things as a community, basically. Um, from the other side of the coin, uh, Apache kind of has some old school ways of doing things. And we're kind of butting heads a bit in um, Peco. So this is, for example, doing releases in CI. We want to do that. We can't yet. Apache only allowed this very recently, half a year ago. So right now, if you want to do a release, you have to build it locally on your machine, do your testing on your machine, you have to sign and do everything on your machine. This is a bit complicated with Peco because uh, at least with the core, you need multiple JDKs to build it correctly. There was some breaking change between JDK 8 and 9. Um, and yeah, we've already had some people make somewhat broken releases because you know they forgot to set the environment variable to the correct JDK and someone else picked it up. So we're pushing some boundaries here as well. Um, also like using git protected tags to make sure that you know, releases cannot be mutated after they're made and things like this. So the incubation. <laughs> so I would have played this clip, but there's a lot of profanity, so I decided not to. <laughs> But I wasn't in a Apache board meeting where they played the clip at the end. <laughs> um, and this was like, <laughs> yeah, fun stuff. Highly recommend to go to their board meetings. <laughs> but basically, the um, incubation process in Apache is quite um, painful. Um, for basically legal, bookkeeping, kind of the things I mentioned before. So one of the problems is, is because we're an incubator, we don't just have one round for releases. We have two. And each of them need three votes from different teams. Yeah. Um, and we have 11 PECO modules, I believe. Um, so that's a lot of votes. And it would have been nice if we like, could somehow simplify the process. Like, for example, the incubator is like its own team. And maybe we should only have one vote from the incubator and three from the PECO PMC, which is like the people that govern PECO to make things easier. Um, this is probably not going to happen by the time we hopefully get out of Incubator. But yeah, the point there is is um, we were kind of, I think, pull, uh, causing people to pull their hair out on the Incubator team with the amount of releases we did. And one of the problems is like if there was a mistake in an annotation, like an um, external code that was taken from outside of ACA wasn't um, mentioned in a notice file, 
this would create a minus one vote, which means then we would have to fix that problem, which usually wasn't too bad, and we'd have to do, redo the whole release again. And each release has a time span of three days, so um, yeah, it was interesting dealing with this. Automation is another thing. Um, Apache projects tended to have a lot of manual things, like I just described how the release process we have to do manually. Um, we'll talk about source distributions a bit later, but that's something we have to provide even though no one uses it. So, we, <laughs> yeah, um, processes are fun. Um, so we want to, one thing that I'm trying to do, and this goes, ties back to SPT, is to try and automate things as much as possible by SPT plugins to make the releases as um, seamless as possible. And all of this has kind of resulted in an impedance mismatch. So this is a beautiful term, I think, which came from electrical engineering. But long story short, it's when you have some process um, that's, or some abstraction, it's also used for like uh, computer science when talking about ORMs and stuff like that, that doesn't really fit how things work in reality. So let's go on to what this exactly means. So, um, Apache has two terms. One is a convenience package, also called a binary, which we would call JARS, and a source distribution. So, from Apache's side, they only care about the source. The source is a tar of the sources. Um, so actually, if you go into GitHub and someone makes a release and you can download the tar, that's like a source distribution. We have to make this manually ourselves and we have to also sign it. One of the interesting things is that they kind of have the expectation that when people download the software, you go to apache.org and you download the source distribution. If you're a good citizen, you check that it's signed by one of the people from the PPMC, like myself to make sure that uh, the person from Apache released it and not someone else. Um, but no one here does that, right? <laughs> I mean, even aside from Apache, who's going to get up to download a source tar for some open source library, compiled it, and maybe published it locally? Yeah. Um, but this is interesting because their entire process was built around this. And so he kind of took a while for them to understand a bit that when people would use Peko, you know, you have a dependency in SPT, Maven, or Gradle, or whatever the hell you want to use, and you just update it, right? Or you just add it in. What's made it even more complicated is that, let's say, if Peko was just a single GitHub module, it may have not been such a problem, right? Um, I mean, no one would still do it, but it wouldn't be too hard to download a source and publish it locally, and then you have it on a new or local Maven repository. But Peko is a multi-module thing, so we have our own dependency tree and with Peko core on the root, and then you have, you know, I think it's HTTP next and gRPC, and then you have streams as you go down, right? So imagine that you want to, your releasing a release manager makes a release, and you want to do the proper thing and download the source and test it, and it's not Peko, but it's I don't know Peko connectors, which used to be called Alpaca. Uh, you would have to do manual dependency management, download all the previous sources, compile, publish locally, and I'm sure we have uh, better things to do in our time. Um, so yeah, that got the, some of the Apache people a while to get their head around. Um, but some of the interesting things about it, which I noticed, which Apache is, um, this is like getting into legal IP stuff, basically. You kind of, if the copyright has changed enough, you're meant to update it and change it. That's the kind of what you're meant to do. The problem with this is, is that someone makes a pull request and changes something. And if like they completely change the algorithm or whatever, then people know, okay, yeah, that's already different enough, we can update the header. Um, but so many people had so many definitions of what has changed that this would create endless internet arguments, which we already have enough of. So basically, we just mark everything as already modified. Um, there's a lot of bookkeeping that we had to do. We, as I mentioned before, we had to annotate, or we had to go through and annotate every single mention of external code, um, which in the entire history of ACA was a lot. Um, it's an interesting question of whether we can use Git or version control systems to do it. And this is like, if people are interested in reading arguments, you can look at the references <laughs> on the bottom. But the point is, does it matter that much? And this is honestly an open question because at least in certain countries or jurisdictions, anyone can kind of sue from anything. 
My takeaway from this is the entire process was very defensive, but it's also there to protect Apache, which is a non-profit and its users. And yeah, given all of this, um, the point is, is what are we fighting for? Um, so basically we had instances, so one of the things is we're not allowed to copy code from ACA BSL. I think this should be obvious. But we have some interesting things. So for example, if there's an issue in ACA and we just read the issue, we're allowed to clean room implement it as long as we don't look at the code. And in some cases, if you clean room implement it, it will by chance, well not by chance, but it will look exactly, almost exactly the same as what the solution in ACA upstream was. So in this case with a test, like because a test has its own style, I mean, if you've contributed to an open source project, you've probably done this. You implement some trivial thing or you fix a bug and then you look at the test code, you probably copy an existing test, modify it a bit to, you know, so it is actually testing what you wanted to test and submit it. And then you'll, and that code will probably look almost very similar to someone who just did it in this case from Lightband. Um, this is something that kind of did stress us a bit. Um, don't worry anyone, this has already been resolved. <laughs> Um, but this is like an interesting thing to deal with because it gets really complicated. So for example, what happens if someone does a PR against ACA and then does a PR against PECO for the same feature? Um, by making a PR against ACA, they've probably read BSL code from ACA already. Just by nature of doing the PR, checking it out locally. Then you get into these discussions about is it derived or not? It's, it's not a black and white answer. Um, you could say, okay, let's swap it. Let's, you know, if someone wants to, for some reason, contribute fixes and features to both, why don't they do PECO first and then contribute to ACA? So they could do that, but then even in contributing on ACA with comments, assuming that the PECO one hasn't been merged yet, the comments can make references to code you know, employees from Lightband can mention code in comments. It just opens up a massive can of worms, which you kind of don't want to get into. Um, so, in a, basically, in quite a few cases, we had to just tell people to pick a side. That's basically the easiest way to solve the problem. And that's what a lot of companies do, which is like, you do not look at the ACA code base at all and you don't touch it. Yeah, this is fun. <laughs> So, um, yeah, we're getting close to the conclusion here. So, one of the beautiful things in doing this is you really, um, you do a lot of cross open source contributions, which helps everyone. I think this is really one of the main points of open source. So, the first two things are plugins that we made. It's probably not interesting to anyone here unless they want to become an Apache project, but we made SPT plugins for creating this source distribution and for, you know, deploying into Apache Sonotype. SPT reproducible builds is somewhat being made by Reboof or R0, and this is like a requirement if we want to make releases in CI, um, you have to have reproducible builds. Um, fun thing is we found already a couple of cases where Scala 3 does not make deterministic bytecode. One was solved. Um, one is not solved yet, we managed to work around it. SPT license report is like another thing that I contributed myself to, so this creates a legal, it goes through your dependency tree and just lists all of the licenses and puts it into docs. Um, the interesting thing here with SPT doc site is basically when we make documentation, we want to keep like the latest X versions of let's say 1.1 and 1.0. Uh, or you want to only keep the latest one. Currently a lot of this is hard coded in YAML. YAML driven development is a lot of fun with GitHub Actions, so it would be nice to make a plugin for this. And yeah, these are all of the things where we have done fixes to. One of the first things that happened, I was pretty adamant about this, I don't know why, but um, Aqua wasn't using Scala format um, in the root um, project. They did use it, they had problems, because this was in Scala format's early days, I think it was like they were using 2.4. Then they disabled it because of problems. And I wanted to put in Scala format because it just solves a lot of problems with people arguing about style. You know, you pick up style and there's no arguments really. But the argument, there was an argument and that was we wanted to match the style that was currently existing in ACA as much as possible. Um, so I forgot the person's name, but there's basically one guy who does almost all of the work on Scala format and he must have had a fun couple of weeks dealing with that, but he did. <laughs> um, 
Well, yeah, and these are the contributions. So the first one is just pull requests, whether they've been closed or merged, and the second one is issues. So um, you can make a back of hand thing and say maybe 30 to 40% you can chuck away as being trivial, whatever, dependency updates, other kinds of things. But I think this is quite impressive where in the 10 months, I think now, this is a lot of work that's been done since um, Pekka was open sourced. So um, I would give a clap to everyone that happened to um, you know, help out. And it's yeah, really nice to see in the end state. Um, another thing is there was another Apache project, Flink, which happened to use Akka. Um, they used it for um, remoting between the different nodes. Um, they initially, when the license change happened, they were thinking of ripping it out. They did their own custom gRPC thing and then they decided to replace it. Uh, well, the, yeah, they wanted to replace it with that, but with Peko, then now they're just using Peko. Tapir is also added in Peko. Um, one that happened lately is Play is moving to Peko. Um, this might have been a bit of a surprise to the community, but um, since the maintainers of Play were already starting to chat and talk about in Peko almost from the fork, it wasn't too surprising from my end. Another interesting thing is Open Collective. So since you can have a company helping out in Peko, that's not disallowed in Apache. Um, Apache actually only cares about individuals, and that's for legal ease of use reasons. So other open source foundations have concepts of companies. Eclipse is an example of this. Um, but with Apache, they don't care. It's individual and individual only. Um, so Open Collective is a thing where you can basically set up a project and companies and individuals can donate to that project and then you have funds there. Everything is transparent, all the invoices, billing, and then you can use those funds to you know, set up hardware and all the other things that might be necessary. So one thing is like doing full-blown cluster tests um, nightly. We currently do this locally because it doesn't exist yet. And there's other things as well. Even in uh, GitHub Run is we're getting into timing issues because of noisy neighbor problems. Um, because everything's under Apache org, which has a lot of, as you can imagine, GitHub projects, um, the resources for the VMs are shared across the org. <laughs> so we get no a lot of noisy neighbor, performance issues with the tests, and those are run quite slowly. And yeah, hopefully we can also integrate more with the Apache ecosystem as well. I mean, Scala is a given, kind of everyone here already knows this. Um, but Apache itself has a lot of interesting you know, tools that we can hopefully work with. And um, yeah, so, closing remarks. Hard forks are always hard. Um, there were a lot of problems. Interesting thing about this point is whether you know, processes should be changed because of the hard fork or whether you want to just treat it as an exception scenario. Um, but yeah, the processes should respect a lot of people's time. So I was working um, so much that I probably was questioning insanity at some point. Um, this will hopefully reduce. Uh, perception, I think, it, which is a major one, um, when you know, companies are deciding what are we going to do. So, um, you know, having to maintain it, get releases out quickly, this is probably more important than a lot of the legal problems, minus the other ones. And yeah, basically we should know what kind of problems we're solving. Hope, luckily we solved almost all of them, so we only have one or two modules left to release, and then we'll be in the next chapter in Peko. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, so I think that is it. Um, questions? <laughs>